What I want to come on to now is, is it plausible that um, messenger ribonucleic acid vaccines are, are leading to some cases of um, cancers and bowel cancers in particular? So I've just picked up the criteria here. Causality may be adjudicated by larger scale associations uh, consistent between countries where other explanations are unlikely, where the effect follows the cause. So it's cause followed by effect, where greater exposure causes more harm with a plausible biological mechanism with coherence between bench sites and epidemiological data supported by even limited experimentation by analogy to other uh, causes of harm and sometimes by reversibility. So it's very important we have the bench science uh, in place, the, the plausible mechanisms. And um, here's some potential mechanisms via which mRNA could be leading to cancers. And these are currently described as theoretical mechanisms. First is DNA integration. Um, genetic information from our mRNA vaccines getting into host, my, your DNA. Um, is this plausible? Um, <clears throat> mRNA fragments um, get into the cells, of course. Um, then there's reverse transcriptase. So this is the enzyme that can convert uh, mRNA into DNA. Um, so normally in a cell, of course, there's the process of transcription where DNA becomes RNA, which makes the proteins. But the RNA can go back via reverse transcriptase and make, <coughs> make DNA, changing the DNA of the host cell potentially. And if there's a change to the DNA of the host cell, what we call a change to the DNA uh, in a cell is a mutation. So if that's happening, it's causing mutation. Of course, cancer is caused by a mutation. So the mechanism there is plausible. Potentially disrupting tumour suppressor genes. So tumour suppressor genes are which, those which suppress excess cell division uh, or uh, activating genes, oncogenic genes, oncogenes, increase the likelihood of um, cancers occurring. So it's quite reasonable to ask, well, I can see why we've got tumour suppressor genes, but why the heck have we got uh, oncogenes? Why on earth would, should we have genes that uh, seem to be designed to increase the likelihood of cancer? Well, of course, these are the genes that were active when we were fetus to, 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 uh, to, to produce the body or when we were children to, to produce the body. Uh, it's just a problem when they go on working because we want cell division when we need it. But then now in the adult form, we don't really want too much cell division. If there's too much, that can lead to uh, malignancy, to cancer. So it's plausible. Uh, DNA contamination integrated into the genome. I think this is plausible. Um, I've talked to quite a few leading scientists who uh, assure me that there are plausible mechanisms for this. Uh, the slam dunk information is not there at the moment. Um, can't think why it wouldn't be in the public domain. Um, but... The mechanism is plausible. That's the whole point. It's plausible. Uh, contamination uh, in vaccine products. So Pfizer, we know, uh, contained uh, modified RNA uh, vaccine, and it also contained the SV40. That's actually a DNA uh, contaminant. And the, uh, the SV40 contaminant, we know this from uh, talking to uh, David Speaker, who did the primary work in, the, uh, in Canada who found SV40, simian virus 40 contamination. So the simian virus is the DNA that can uh, inactivate tumour suppressor genes. So if you think about it, the tumour suppressor genes is normally suppressing the tumour. <coughs> um, if you inactivate the tumour suppressor gene, for example, uh, one called P53 and one called RB, if they're inactivated, then the tumours are not suppressed, so the tumours can go uh, on and develop, promoting unchecked cell growth. So again, the theory uh, makes, makes sense. This is, this is biologically plausible. This is not implausible. <laughs> um, this is not ludicrous conspiracy theory. Th these are plausible biological mechanisms. Um, prolonged spike protein expression. Now, sadly, uh, in the vaccines, they had this uh, one methyl pseudouridine modified mRNA. So the uridine, of course, is one of the bases in the RNA <clears throat> and the incorporation of this pseudo-uridine. So it's not the natural uridine that we would like. It's a false one. It's, it's a biologically manipulated one. 
And that means the, the, the uh, mRNA hangs around for longer. And we know that spike protein has been detected in patients after vaccination. From memory, we looked at one study where it was 700 days. To me, there's only two real mechanisms where the spike protein could be going on being produced for 700 days. One is the reverse transcriptase, that it's in our genes, which is probably the worst possible scenario. And the other is this uh, pseudouridine allows the RNA to last for a long, long, long time inside our cells. Either way, spike protein can be going on being produced for long periods of time, which is not what we want. So rather a reckless experiment, in my view, to put that into the mRNA vaccines, but it was done and it's still there as far as I know. Um, encoding SARS coronavirus 2 spike protein so the protein could be being produced over a long period of time. Another possibility <coughs> is that lipid nanoparticles could be delivered to stem cells. Now, the stem cells are the cells from which other cells are produced. So you'll have a stem cell uh, and that will divide and it will produce another stem cell. And the other one that divides goes on and produces a population of other cells. It could be anywhere. It could be in the liver. It could be in the, uh, could be in the skin. Uh, could be the blood. Um, so stem cells, um, if if the if there's a genetic change in the stem cells, that can be uh, passed on. Basically, it's basically a, a progenitor cell that can be passed on through many generations of cells onto onto future stem cells. And now we know that the mRNA uh, lipid nanoparticle the mRNA in the lipid nanoparticles goes everywhere around the body. Uh, we were deceived about that. We now know it goes everywhere. Of course, it's completely plausible that it could go to stem cells. It could go to any cell, any cell. So completely plausible that it could go to, um, uh, what do you call them? The uh, stem cells. <laughs> Sorry, yeah. Right, so sustained spike protein production will lead to chronic inflammation. Chronic inflammation, of course, can lead to cancer, disrupting cellular repair mechanisms leading to cancer. And, and this is kind of an axiom that, um, you know, it's so well known that chronic inflammation leads to cancer. A chronic inflammation from human papillomavirus in the cervix. Chronic inflammation from uh, gastroesophageal research di di disease in, in the esophagus. This, this is well known. Um, chronic inflammation in the colon from Crohn's or colitis causing colon cancer. Uh, another plausible mechanism, uh, immune suppression or dysregulation, molecular mimicry. So it could be that some um, molecules on cells have a similar shape to the antibodies that are produced in response to the spike protein. They will, therefore will start beating up on the, uh, the body's own proteins. So if a vaccine stimulates a particular antibody, that antibody, yes, it can attack the protein which it was designed to uh, attack, but it can also attack um, proteins on cell surfaces which look similar. It's called molecular mimicry. They, so sometimes it can be almost identical. And uh, it basically starts beating up on our own tissues. This is autoimmune disease. Uh, and that leads to inflammation, and inflammation, as we know, leads to can lead to cancer alteration of regulatory t cell function so um you get t uh, suppressor cells uh and you get t helper cells if they're dysregulated that can potentially allow pre-existing cancers to progress um, we know that t cell immunity <coughs> t lymphocyte immunity is totally vital we learned this from professor uh, dalgleish and professor clancy um and we know that Professor Dalgleish invented a uh, simple bacterial preparation that can boost T cells that was submitted to the Medicines and Healthcare Products Regulatory Agency who refused to license it, which is a pity because I would like it because I would like my T cells up upgraded. Um, but I'm not allowed it. N neither are you. Outrageous that this isn't allowed to be prescribed uh, compassionately after Professor Dalgleish went to all the bother of developing it and collecting data on it. Um, really is uh, a major loss to humanity uh, and probably more specifically to me and you as well. Um, anyway, so that's, again, completely plausible mechanism. If, if, the spike, uh, if the spike protein shares epitopes with tumour suppressor proteins, for example, so epitope is the part the immune system recognises as being foreign, if they're on a tumour suppressor proteins, those proteins will be beaten up by the antibodies. Therefore, the tumour suppressor proteins will be 
depress themselves. Therefore, the tumour suppressor proteins will not be free to suppress uh, tumours. So uh, plausible bio biological mechanisms. Because of those biological mechanisms, uh, we should plug that in, as it were, into the, the Bradford Hill idea, all these mechanisms. Um, but of course, we don't have the national level data in most countries that can, allows us to compare vaccinated with unvaccinated people or indeed the gradated risk with increased number of vaccines. So um, I will call for that data to be released so that a Bradford Hill analysis can be done and then we'll know. But are there plausible biological mechanisms? I think in this video we've demonstrated that yes, this is there are plausible biological mechanisms that need further investigation. Um, can't imagine the British government's going to be paying for those. Can't imagine big farmers going to be paying for those. So may not be done. We may never know. Until it becomes patently obvious in the future. And by that time, all the people that are making the decisions now will have been retired or died. The blood, the infected blood scandal in my U, in the UK only came out. It started in the 1980s, and the report was only last year. Was it last year or the early this year? Last year, I think. So, uh, 80, like 30, 30 year gap. So, younger viewers. We'll get the definitive information maybe in 20 or 30 years. Now, I hope I'm being over cynical and we know before that. But um, so many things are covered up. Sadly, we, we might never know the truth, which, of course, in my view, is totally outrageous. There you go. We're just pawns in the game. More important people know what information we're allowed and what we're not allowed. We won't get mad, we'll leave it there. Thank you for watching.